Willkommen. Ich will auch von Ihnen eine Frage stellen. Ich habe eine Frage für Sie. Ich habe eine Frage für Sie. Guten Abend und willkommen zum 9. Jahrhundert Syrien Festival. Mein Name ist Sadiq und ich bin der Schabbat von Margie Wargis Parish in Syrien, Kalifornien. Und es ist mein größtes Ehre und Freude, die Meister der Zeremonie dieses Jahr für das Syrien Festival, gehostet durch die Syrien Kirche der Ost. Ich möchte mich bedanken, dass Sie hier sind. 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 I would also like to take this time and thank our humble and gracious sponsors, who without them, the festival wouldn't come to fruition. Mesopotamia, the land between two rivers. This is the name that the ancient Greeks gave to the triangular shaped parcel of land where the history of human civilization begins. We know it as Beit Nahran. This land falls between the borders of modern day Syria, Turkey, and most of Iraq. It is measured around 350 miles long by 150 miles wide. This is where humans pondered upon their existence in the world and devised methods of developing their existence. The earliest Mesopotamian people settled in this area because of the fertility of the soil for growing crops. Hence the name we all recognize, the Cradle of Civilization. This is one of the major contributing factors for human society. The beginnings of civilization as we know are found in the southern part of the Tigris Euphrates River valleys. Almost 9,000 years ago, the first indications of agriculture in domesticated barley are found in the ancient city-states of Sumer Ur. This area, with its fertile soil and scarce rainfall, coupled with the overflow of the twin rivers, provided for the most ideal and protected soil on the earth. The first city-states began to be formed around 3500 BC, thus forming the first units of human society. Now we will see some highlights from the ancient Assyrians, the greatest empire that rose out of the cradle of civilization to civilize human society and the world at large. The descendants of these ancient and great people are still alive and vibrant today, and they are gathered here to celebrate and share their great heritage and culture with you all. The Assyrian letters. Although the ancient Assyrians used cuneiform, the modern Assyrian language today consists of 22 letters. These letters were presented by the children of the diocese. Allah. Beat. Gamal. Dalat. Hey. Wow. Zen. Khet. Bayat.
the Assyrian flag. Since being designed in 1971, the Assyrian flag has become widely used to represent the Assyrian nation in the homeland and in diaspora. The Assyrian flag consists of a white background on which three waving stripes emerge from each corner of a center design, which is in the shape of a four-headed star. In the center of the flag, the star encompasses a golden circle representing Shamash, the Assyrian sun god, who was believed to give life to all things on earth. The four points of the star symbolize the land, and their sky blue color represents happiness and tranquility. Now let's welcome Ms. Lauren Piro wearing a gown depicting the Assyrian flag. The waving stripes extending from the center to the four corners of the flag symbolize the three major rivers flowing through the land of Assyria. The Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Great Zab. At top, we see the mighty Euphrates noted in a dark blue color representing abundance. In the center, the Great Zab is in white portraying peace. And in the bottom, we see the mighty Tigris, whose blood red hue represents the Syrian national pride courage and glory. These three stripes also are pictured the race the center star and stand to symbolize the spurge of the Assyrian people, the four corners of the world. The manner in which these stripes emerge from the star also symbolically portray the eventual return of the Assyrians to their ancestral homeland, which are represented by the center of the star. To the Assyrians, the flag represents the current struggle that our people are enduring in their Christian faith and national identity. As Assyrians, we were the first people to accept Christianity. Thus, it is only fitting that the Assyrian Church of the East, who has maintained and protected the Assyrian language, culture, and identity, Now, we would like to take you back in time to the Assyrian Empire, thousands of years before Christ. Puabi. Around 2600 BC, Queen Puabi of Ur was known to have two royal lyres or hearts. These are some of the oldest instruments ever discovered. Notice Queen Puabi's very distinct and intricate gold headdress with three metal flowers on top. The headdress was discovered in her tomb when it was excavated. What we know about this beautiful queen comes from the remains and treasures found in the royal cemeteries of Ur in the 1920s. Yaba. Queen Yaba, meaning beautiful, was the wife of Tiglath Pileser III, who reigned from 744 to 727 BC, and is known for her gold tiara and vast gold treasures that were found in 1989 in the royal tombs of the Nimrud Palace. With Queen Yaba were buried two other famous Assyrian queens. Atalia. Queen Atalia, who was the wife of King Sargon II, who reigned from 721 to 705 BC, was mentioned in inscribed objects found in the Nimrud tombs. This queen was known to have much gold treasures and owned a mirror with a handle shaped like a palm tree. Found also in Nimrud was a carved ivory called, commonly called the Assyrian Mona Lisa of Nimrud. Sargon II later moved his capital to Dur and is also known to maintain and ensure justice while also increasing the influence and status of both women and scribes at royal court. His successor was his son, our next king. Sennacherib and Nakia. King Sennacherib reigned from 705 to 681 BC and is known for creating the Hanging Gardens of Nineveh, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. With massive aqueducts and mention of Archimedes fruits, Cuneiform experts such as Professor Daly have identified that the hanging gardens were actually situated in Nineveh and constructed during Sennacherib's rule. The gardens were located near King Sennacherib's palace and were set upon vaulted terraces irrigated by pumps from the Euphrates River. King Sennacherib is best known for his amazing military leadership and campaigns that led to the expansion of the Assyrian Empire, which continued to grow through the reign of his descendants. His queen, Nathia, 
was a daughter-in-law of Sargon II, mother of Isar Haddun, and grandmother of Ashur Barnipal. Nakia was one of the few ancient Assyrian women to be depicted in artwork, commission her own building projects, and write and issue a treaty. Ashur Barnipal and the Bali Shabbat. Ashurbani Paul inherited the world's largest empire which stretched from the shores of the eastern Mediterranean to the mountains of western Iran. He ruled from his massive capital at Nineveh located in the modern day city of Mosul in northern Iraq. This strong, educated ruler of Assyria was known for the Ashurbani Paul Library of Cuneiform Writings, one of the first libraries of the known world where more than 100,000 Cuneiform texts. Guided by his love for scholarship and knowledge, he defined the course of the Assyrian Empire. Recently, the British Museum had an Assyrian exhibition titled after this king's quote, I am Ashurbanipal, king of the world, king of Assyria. Ashurbanipal was also known as a heroic warrior king and for many lion hunt reliefs. His queen, Labali Sharat, also shared the king's scholarly and literary interests. Both monarchs are depicted in the relief called the Banquet of Ashurbanipal, or Garden Scene, which was originally found in the Ashurbanipal Palace in Inway and now back at the British Museum after being displayed on loan at the Getty Museum. Our last Assyrian queen was a breathtaking beauty. She epitomized the elegance and royalty. She possessed the undeniable essence that would lead to legends being told about her throughout the world for centuries to come. Much of what is known about this queen belongs to the world of lore and legend. However, history states that she was a real figure and the Assyrian wife of Shemshi Adad V. Her existence is verified by the inscription on the monument after her name. Yet when the powerful Assyrian king died and Prince heir Adad Nari III was still too young to rule, this beautiful and elegant queen would transform herself to maintain the great Assyrian kingdom. After her husband's death, she reigned from 811 BC to 806 BC. She would have thus been in control of the vast Assyrian Empire at the time, which is, which is more amazing is that she was the first female monarch that the world has known almost 800 years prior to the reign of Cleopatra. This queen achieved remarkable fame and power in her lifetime and beyond. According to contemporary records, she had considerable influence at the Assyrian court. This would explain how she was able to maintain the throne after her husband's death. It was not common for women to possess positions of authority in the Assyrian Empire, and to have a woman ruler would have been unth unthinkable unless that person had enough power to take and hold it. Many of the Assyrian ruler are of her running into battle. These portrayals stem from her successful campaign she waged against her enemies, and the novelty of a woman ruling such a great empire. Not only did this queen become the new ruler of the Assyrian Empire, but she also became a fierce warrior and led her powerful military in these campaigns. Who was this legendary Assyrian warrior queen who helped create her chariot and lead her military into battle? She was none other than Queen Samaramis, or Shapuramat, Shemirama, meaning my name is exalted. She is best known to Assyrian today as Shamiran. I present to you Shamiran, Queen of Assyria! Yes. 
Another round of applause, please, for our parade. Thank you very much. I will now be introducing the Assyrian folk dancers in the Assyrian Church of the East, Diocese of California, that would like to share their culture with you through dance. These young dancers attend Assyrian language school and church youth groups at their local parishes, where they learn to read, write, and speak in their native language. The students have found that dancing is a fun and easy way to express and teach others about their culture. Starting our performance today is the Urhei Dance Group, which ranges from ages of 8 to 13. This group has prepared Chigya. Chigya is the most popular Assyrian type of dancing. It is a form of line dancing where dancers hold hands around the dance floor. There are multiple foot patterns that dancers may perform. Chigya is thought to have been danced for thousands of years. Today, it is usually performed at weddings and joyous occasions. Let's get a round of applause for the Urhe Dance Group!
Now the moment we have all been waiting for, let's all welcome the Nahran Dance Crew! We have Nathaniel Jembri and Sophie Ismail.
These dancers are wearing traditional Kali decorated clothes known as Juluk Fumala. They are normally worn during important celebrations and ceremonies like weddings, cultural events, and festivals. These students living in our homeland's colder climates such as Jiru, Baz, Khoma, Mazra, Yare, and Daz also wear these traditional clothing. There are many different styles and colors of Juluk Fumala that are decorated with elaborate patterns and designs that would be fitting for dancing in front of Assyrian royalty and when going into battle. Today, Juluk Fumala is commonly used for dancing. Our next dance is Hare Gole or just Gole, for short. It is a type of finger that moves in a clockwise direction or to the left. Hare Gole was often danced by Assyrian mountain tribes and involves hopping on alternate feet and multiple songs. Now I present to you Hare Gole. The next dance of the night will be a partner dance known as Mediana. It is a modified fast-paced version of a dance to Lama. I present to you Shopshaha. <laughs>
sense is a spin off of a dance known as Chazade. Chazade in Syria means cultivators or harvesters. For nearly 8,000 years, agriculture and irrigation have been a vital part of Assyrian life and is reflected in this dance. As many of you know, even the first Assyrian settlers to Turlock in the Central Valley chose this region for its rich soil and fertile farmland. Now our dancer will perform Chazade. Take it away, boys.
of all. Thank you to all of our generous sponsors and to the many festival volunteers. It takes a lot of work to put something like this on. I appreciate all of you. Thank you, festival volunteers. And we have to acknowledge that these volunteers were led by Ralph Oshaba and Sweeney Nuwara. We ask that they come to the stage, please, so you can be acknowledged. We thank them for their hard work and for, for putting all of this together for us. Also, we want to give our thanks to the one and only, the talented Ninos Potros. And our own, Zulma Daula, Salgis, and Dilmon. Thank you, we appreciate you. You're ours. Okay, now we're going to welcome our Ninwa dance group of the Assyrian Church of the East. They've been with us since the beginning of our festival. We have dancers uh, that just got back from Salmanaca, Spain. They performed there, so we're very proud of them. These talented dancers are now going to share their beautiful and ancient Assyrian dances with you. Okay, for the first time at festival, this dance that they're going to perform is a modified Aziatama dance, and it's to a song by Talal Rish. You guys ready? So, just so you know, this dance does have some blades involved, so please just scoot back if you can. Our dancers are excellent, and you'll see them perform when the video from Spain comes on, but they're amazing, so please enjoy this.